understand. So this is the members meeting and speaker series for December 7th, 2021. I can't believe it's December. I hope everybody is, is doing well and uh, either has their, their shopping done or has things on order and are getting their, their stuff from Amazon or wherever you have, may have ordered things from or maybe have given donations to other uh, organizations. So again, as I'm, I'm the board member and I'm membership chair, I'm also the treasurer. I wear many, many, many different hats. All righty. So are we ready for these, the quiz answers? I hope so. All righty. So. The word peregrine means, well, it means traveling or wandering. And I, I think the Saladins are nodding their heads yes, which I, I, I hope is, uh, is good. <laughs> um, you all have a long way. Yeah. <laughs> you say that again. I said they could travel a long way. <laughs> they do. And I, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, peregrines are found on just about every continent, not, yeah, not it, Antarctica, right? Yep, yes. except, oh, yeah, even in there? Oh, wow. So, yeah, actually, yeah. Act, actually, a lot of people don't know it, but they're the most cosmopolitan of all birds, birds of prey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah. there yeah. you go. And peregrines, they really do like to consume birds. Uh, birds are one of their desired prey. Uh, peregrine falcons were originally, maybe some of you recognize them as duck hawks. And if you have old field guides, sometimes yep. that is listed as a, their common name, duck hawk. Uh, but, you know, they take a wide variety of birds and um, um, pigeons being a favorite, but, you know, whatever they can get their, their talons and feet on, that's what they can go after. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So where might I find peregrine falcons around Cleveland? And the choices were, let me go back to my quiz. Where might I find them around Cleveland? Near rivers and lakes, on city buildings, perched on bridges, or all of the above? Well, the answer is all of the above. They do like to be near water. Uh, rivers and lakes because that does attract, remember, duck hawk, waterfowl, um, gulls, um, you know, birds need water. So there's a lot of things that they, they will um, uh, feed on that are, uh, again, by water. And of course, cities have become a, a really a, a wonderful place for them because the next question, peregrine falcons like to nest on cliff ledges. Yeah, they do. So then why might I see them around cities? Well, think about it. If you're a bird flying around a city, you don't know the difference between a terminal tower and a cliff ledge so or a bridge. So to them, all those high rises uh, and bridges look very, very much like, uh, like cliffs and, and mountainous areas. I, they call it the concrete canyons. So again, they've taken to nesting uh, on bridges and buildings in major cities, New York, um, Columbus, uh, Chicago, again, major cities, and of course, Cleveland, major city. And uh, just showing a couple of photographs. Here's a peregrine. This is on St. Ignatius. And I think it's eating, got a pigeon. That's what it looks like. And I don't remember where I got this photo. Sorry, it's a little fuzzy because I blew it up a bit. But I, this is not Cleveland, but how would you like that nesting on your balcony? Yeah, I think that's look at that. Look at the look at those little ones in the in the nest box. Look how cute they are. Yeah, but and so that that's a high rise. But but look at that. Look at that landscape. I mean, you would think that that there wouldn't be a, a, a thing living in that type of landscape. And yet there is the peregrines raising four little chicks in that photo. So I love it. 
I do want to mention that uh, we accept memberships uh, year round. We like to get our membership renewals in or new members in at the beginning of our, our year, which runs September 1st through uh, August 31st. And you can see we have a, a wide variety of price ranges for memberships. They begin at $20 for students and limited income, uh, $40 for individuals, $55 for nonprofit families, and $150 for businesses. And you can see on and on and on. And we accept checks, PayPal, just throw me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may be familiar with uh, the Sherwin Williams building that is planned for downtown Cleveland. And that next slide I'm going to show is what the building is proposed to look like. I think pretty much it has been approved. But I think many of you can see that there are some concerns about the building. You've noticed the reflection of another of the buildings from downtown. This entire building, plus a lot of the buildings lower uh, on their campus, and this is public square, uh, and you're, you're looking towards the building, clad in glass. So, Western Cuyahoga, uh, Kirtland Bird Club, Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, uh, Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, uh, Ohio Ornithological Society, and on and on. A number of organizations had a letter writing campaign, and I think some of our uh, Audubon members uh, and Kirtland Bird Club members also sent personal letters to the City of Cleveland Planning Commission, um, the uh, County Planning Commission, and maybe some even sent to the Sherwin Williams company directly uh, to encourage to really take a look at this, at what the architects have designed, and encouraging them to turn to uh, have the glass be bird safe glass. So modifying the glass to be bird safe glass and modifying the lighting, especially during migration, spring and fall migration. This is when the birds uh, are moving through. They are up high uh, as, as the dawn is coming. They begin to descend into the city areas, our green spaces, the parks. And that reflective glass is, is bad. Uh, they, they wind up crashing into the glass. And um, of course, many of the birds that um, are, are do die, uh, those birds that are um, collected that are still alive, go to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center for rehab. Yes, many are, are, are rehabbed and released, but still there's a lot of mortality. So with this letter writing um, uh, campaign, we got the ear of the City Planning Commission. They are taking a second look. They are asking the architects to take a second look at the glass and what type of glass to be used. There is glass that ha can have um, not just the little decals that you may have seen before, that doesn't work very well, but actually having marks on the glass about two inches apart, birds will not fly, or birds, it reduces the birds uh, flying into the glass because they can't fit through those, what they perceive as a little square with those dots uh, on the glass. So we're hoping that Sherwin Williams will be a, a progressive uh, company in the fact that they're going to uh, change the glass to be bird safe. I would like to see it on the entire building. Uh, some reports say that only the lower few floors need to have this special glass uh, or the bird safe glass. But you know, when you have a building that is totally glass, all reflective, you're going to get something crashing into it, um, day, night, whatever, I would like to see the whole thing. Um, but at least we've got their ear and uh, we'll keep you in, as informed as possible on what other steps might need to be taken. Um, 
who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll see how things, how things go. And we thank you for sending in letters. If you were one that sent in letters uh, or wrote a letter to the editor or anything like that, that would be, that's wonderful. Guess what? Christmas bird count is coming up. Uh, mark your calendars. Um, we The day of the Christmas count is Sunday, December 26th. That is the Christmas count day. But we've got a couple of other things going on. Uh, coming up on Monday, December 13th, a little less than a week from now, we are having a, a virtual kickoff. So we're going to be going through how to do the Christmas count, the count circle, uh, where we need extra folks, how to turn in your data, as well as a little bit of bird identification. So this is for people who have done Christmas counts in the past, plus people who are, are new to the Christmas count. We'd love to have you join our virtual kickoff. Um, that's on a Monday, December 13th at seven o'clock. Uh, you can go to the website and uh, register for that Zoom uh, presentation. Um, the Christmas count day, of course, Sunday, December 26th, you're out uh, counting birds in our count circle, which is called the Lakewood Circle. After we finish the count, uh, it takes me a couple weeks to get a few things wrapped up and the data coming into me as the compiler. And then we're going to have a wrap up on Monday, January 10th at seven o'clock. And that's just going through the list and looking at photographs that people have taken and sharing stories. It's, it's a lot of fun. So uh, we hope that again, those who might be interested in joining the Christmas count, again, please go to the website, contact me um, uh, and uh, we'll get you uh, helping out in our Christmas bird count. And I love this photograph. Uh, last year was a pretty snowy year. So uh, uh, Buster with his bird nerds and they were at Coal Lake and Berea. And you can see that was pretty snowy that day. All righty, uh, Michelle Brocious, our board member and field trip co-coordinator. Um, Michelle, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can oh, you hear me? Fabulous, yes, I can. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Um, like I said, my name is Michelle Brocious, and I have a few announcements to make. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I was taking a drink of water. No, no problem. All right, so I'm going to discuss uh, the second Saturday bird walks and invite you to the next one and um, cover the report from our previous walk. Uh, I'm going to discuss the virtual field trips as well as a little blurb about how you can connect with us on social media. The next slide, please. All right, so uh, please join us on December 11th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot for our second Saturday bird walk. We meet at this location and time every second Saturday of the month, usually between the upper and lower parking lots. And then we take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dininger, Dave Grasskemper, and Ken Gover are our leaders for the walk. Next slide, please. All right, so this past second Saturday was held on November 13th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, uh, we had 24 observers on the November 2021 second Saturday of the month bird walk. It was cloudy the entire walk, started at 30 degrees and ended at 30 degrees. A little snow fell just before the walk began, but ended after a few minutes. We had observed 24 species. Many of the expected species were present. Highlights were three brown creepers that were elusive. Tree sparrows showed briefly. Two pileated woodpeckers were active, calling and flying on several occasions. 10 downy woodpeckers were very active. The best highlight was our resident barred owl who was high in a pine tree. All right, next slide, please. That hasn't switched for me. I don't know if there's no, a delay on that. No, it hasn't switched for me either. There okay. You go. I don't okay, know why. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. No problem. All right. So November's virtual field trip. Last month, our virtual field trip was held at Chagrin River Park. Our target species were the wild turkey um, in honor of Thanksgiving and the white-throated sparrow. 
Every month I invite Audubon members and guests to visit a certain location, usually an important bird area independently, and then provide something to me of their visit, usually bird lists, journaling, or photos. Then I compile into a scrapbook. Uh, the virtual meetup during which I will present the scrapbook takes place the second Wednesday of the following month, which means it is taking place tomorrow at 7 p.m. If you visit the location and have something to, to submit to me, uh, please do so immediately so that I can get your item into the scrapbook. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the park last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. All right, next slide, please. There we go. So December is virtual field trip. Uh, this month, the virtual field trip takes place at Euclid Creek Reservation in search of Delta Kingfishers and Mergansers. My advice is to go earlier this month before the river freezes for a chance at seeing these birds. During your visit to the reservation, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. You can take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen, tally identified species, or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcautobahn.org and clicking the field trips tile and then field reports 2021. Next slide, please. And lastly, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So please be sure to subscribe. All right, next slide. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, appreciate that a lot. Uh, the virtual field trips are fun. The meetups are, are great. So we hope to see many of you uh, join and just see what has been cited. It's been great. Uh, Drina Nemes will be talking now about our uh, book discussion series. Drina, are you there? I sure am. Thank you very much. And I just want to say, uh, Michelle, the the photographs are so beautiful. The one of the titmouse was, was just outstanding. Well, thank so you so beautiful. much. I appreciate really that, beautiful. thank you. Well, our book discussion, the themes for this year have been birding and conservation, and we've been looking at nonfiction non and historical fiction. Next slide, please. And for our next book club discussion, we're going to be discussing the classic Silent Spring. I have to admit I hadn't read it before, uh, although I feel that it I should have, um, but I'm glad I've had the opportunity now. So if you could register on the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society webpage, um, it helps us to know who's coming. And also you can Purchase this book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or eBay. Um, and of course, it's available at your library and, and looking at the Cuyahoga Public Library um, offerings, many of them are now ebooks and also audio. Next slide, please. Well, part of this book, there's a beautiful introduction about Rachel Carson. We learn a little bit more about her and what a pioneer she was. Um, she really brought the environmental movement into um, grassroots and bringing it along. Unfortunately, she died in 1964, so she did not have the opportunity to see what happened, especially in 1970 with the first Earth Day. But she had uh, majored in biology and got a master's degree in zoology and graduated in 1932. And in the next decade, she was beginning to see the effects of new chemicals that had been introduced. Um, so she, Silent Spring is a lot about pesticides and insecticides. And also she brings the alarm to, to all of us, to consumers, 
to be looking at what has been happening and why our government would allow us, would allow such things to happen. And she particularly in this book, as far as I've read, uh, is looking at the Department of Agriculture, which seemed to use very harsh insecticides indiscriminately. Also, she shows really the limits of science and technology in terms of what the boundaries that they need to have. Next slide, please. Uh, she was an English major when she started out in college and her first three books, Under the Sea Wind, The Sea Around Us and The Edge of the Sea are, are um, I haven't read them yet. I, they're on my list for Santa Claus to bring, but they look very closely at marine um, biology, which was her, which was her major. And then another book she wrote, The Sense of Wonder, uh, was published posthumously. She died of breast cancer and it was a, a long and drawn out and painful illness for her. Silent Spring, 1962, almost 60 years ago. Uh, and what has struck me about this book is there's so much evidence to show the harmful effects of insecticides. She also seemed to be kind of bringing this idea that there's an ecology just to the human body, uh, an ecology just to that itself, which was a newer idea. And also she linked health and environment. And that was somewhat of a newer concept back then. Uh, she was really uh, such a major force behind the environmental movement. And I'm glad to say she got the 1963 Audubon Medal. She got some recognition. Next slide, please. So we'll, we are going to talk about this on Tuesday, January 25th in the brand new year of 2022. And looking ahead in April, we're going to be discussing a true story, the feather thief, very exciting story. Um, and hope you will join us for both of those. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Drina. Uh, I just want to mention that, you know, what, what Rachel Carson did uh, 60 years ago is still very pertinent today. I, she was kind of ahead of her time uh, with the pesticides, insecticides, and then, you know, health and the environment, human health in the environment, just, um, you know, who would have thought, uh, but it's just very pertinent today as well. Well, I'm on again, guess what? But uh, we're always um, doing some projects in various things. And we do have a small bluebird trail that is in the Rocky River Reservation at the Lewis Road Riding Ring. Obviously, the bluebirds are not nesting now. Uh, we'd like to increase our bluebird trail. And we have the uh, Jean Misty Bluebird Project. Um, we are asking for donations. Uh, those will help to purchase bird boxes um, and uh, allow us to, um, well, we get lots of volunteers to help us. And uh, this information does go to the uh, Ohio Bluebird Society. So again, it is a little bit of a science project that we're running and we'd like to increase our, our, our outreach with the, the bluebirds. But it's not just bluebirds, it's ca other cavity nesters. Tree swallows did very well this year uh, in some of those boxes as well. I've got some dirt for you. Uh, we have an awesome Christmas gift. Um, this is tilf soil. This is soil that is created through by the Rust Belt Riders, which is a Cleveland company from composted food waste. Uh, food waste that is picked up from restaurants, from uh, people's uh, donations. They have a special a bucket that they put out or deliver. Um, and the Rust Belt Riders creates uh, this wonderful product. We do have it available now. Um, the ones that we do have, and they have three varieties, one is called sprout, which is an all-purpose soil, 
house soil is for house plants. Um, the third type is called grow, which is really for uh, more, you know, starting, you're, you're putting in your garden outside, uh, flowers, beds, that type of thing. But right now we have sprout and house soil. Uh, you can see from the size of the bag here. Um, this is a $10 bag and yeah, this can be delivered to your home in the next day or so. I mean, quicker than it. Well, maybe not quicker than Amazon, but we can get this for to you um, $10 for a bag. So you can contact us at info at wcaudubon.org or go to our homepage and find out how you can uh, get that paid for, order it, and uh, it'll be in your at your house in the next couple of days. We are also selling birds and beans coffee, which is the only type of coffee. It's 100% um, certified to the Smithsonian uh, shade grown bird friendly coffee. And I, we have some bags already here. Right now we have five pound bags of dark roast. Oh my gosh, it smells wonderful. This is whole bean though. This is a five pound bag of whole bean coffee. It is available right now. I've got a couple of bags and it can be delivered in a day or so. Uh, we are asking $50, for this entire bag. Um, yes, you will have to grind it fresh, but I, you can't have any fresher coffee than, you know, fresh ground in your own, in your own kitchen. Um, but this is uh, what's called the dark roast. It's called the, it's called scarlet tanager. It's not made from scarlet tanagers, but it is dark roast and uh, again, whole bean. Uh, if you'd like to get smaller quantities and with a grind that you like, please get your order in by December 10th, and that will get you a delivery before the holidays. Now, one thing I also have to announce, since we do not have a coordinator uh, for our coffee sales, um, we're gonna have to be suspending the ordering the coffee after December. So in the new year, unless we get a coffee coordinator, um, we're, we're really having a tough time, you know, getting all of this stuff done. So if anyone's interested in coordinating our coffee uh, sales and promoting it, um, please let us know at info at wcaudubon.org. I know there's a number of people that like the coffee, so we would hate to really suspend the sale of it. But right now, uh, it's just getting a little tougher. It's just like... Um, so many other positions that are out there that are are just uh, having a tough time getting somebody. But thank you for listening. And we do have a photography contest. The featured bird for December is the Northern Cardinal. And that's a very fitting bird for our, our uh, December photography contest. The contest runs December 1st and closes at the end of December the 31st. We will announce our winners at the next member and speaker meeting, which uh, is on January 4th. Uh, we're asking the $5 for each photo that is entered, and we have youth and adult categories. Uh, for those folks who do win the contest for, of the month, we also have a yearly contest. So put all the folks who have won each month and then there are some additional prizes. To register, please go to the homepage and the uh, www.wcaudubon.org and click on the photo contest button. We also like to eat ice cream, even in the winter time. Oh, but we also have uh, uh, gift cards at $10 denominations for Mitchell's ice cream, but they also do sell frozen yogurt and sorbet and vegan ice cream. So if you'd like a stocking stuffer, $10, we've got a few cards left. And so um, again, go to our, our store and order up some of those cards. They'll either be in the mail or delivered directly to you again within the next couple of days.
All righty. We're getting closer to our presentation this evening, but I wanted to announce our program for next month, uh, Tuesday, January 4th. Uh, Judy Semrock, maybe some of you know that name or have heard her before. She will be presenting a wonderful program called Hiding in Plain Sight, Amazing Camouflage Mimicry and Evasion in Nature. And she's going to work her magic with the presentation because she's going to tie it in a lot with birds and birding. Uh, so uh, it's again, kind of a, a, a program made for us. Um, and she's gonna, again, really uh, highlight the birds. So we hope that you can join us for on Tuesday, January 4th. Uh, please do uh, register. But this evening, oh man, I just cannot wait for this program. Chad and Chris Saladin are experts at photographing the peregrines, at keeping track of the peregrine falcons, and it's not just in Rocky River Reservation or the Rocky River Valley, but you know, at the zoo and downtown and they hear about a pair of peregrines here and there, but they're really gonna focus on the peregrine falcons in the Rocky River Reservation. And I'm gonna let them talk a lot more about how they got interested in peregrine falcons and um, you know, what makes the, the birds so, so exciting? I know, I, I know why they're exciting, but you know, <laughs> what struck them that they were, that, that really got them hooked on the peregrine falcon. So we are so pleased to have Chad and Chris Saladin this evening mm -hmm. on the, a closer look at the peregrines of the Rocky River Reservation. And we thank you so much. Right. Well, thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. And you know, the W the Western Cuyahoga Audubon is are the real stars of the show. They really have done so much for birds and conservation. And you know, from Nancy talking about Sherwin Williams to uh, and lights out and the and the help that they do to teach young birders and educate. It's just phenomenal. So we really um, we were really honored to be able to speak for for you guys and and uh, really appreciate everybody coming to to hear the talk. I'm sorry if I mixed up a little bit of, of the timing of it for everybody out there that I posted to the page and things. But um, and I might need a little help on how to figure out how to put the the slides up. So that was something, Nancy, that that we did before, but I don't know if I can repeat. <laughs> so um, yeah, it is. And I'm looking. Okay, I think I. Oh. Oh shoot. I'm looking to find where I can make you the host. Hold on. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, there you go. Make a host, and then you can share your screen. Okay. You have your little screen share button at the bottom. All right. I maybe we need to do this again. Let's see. Are you still hearing me? Yes. Okay. Um, you see the green screen share at the bottom? Okay. Or wherever it may be on your screen. Uh, yeah, we did practice this. <laughs> we did. Yeah. We tried. Right there. Okay. Your screen. Share screen, yeah. okay. And um, this looks a little different. <laughs> there, do we have it? Yes. Is it up? All I right. <laughs> Woo! This might be a wild ride because we're really not used to this. So no, <laughs> you're doing especially me. <laughs> My hands are sweating and everything. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Like Nancy said, we're going to do a, a little review of the uh, nest side of Hilly Road Bridge and Rocky River Metro Parks. Um, um, but first of all, we want to, I, I want to just go over briefly for people that might not know the history of Hilliard Road site. Um, it's very interesting story how they ended up there. 
um, the original pair showed up at uh, Witten Carlisle place there, uh, the high rise in Lakewood for people who don't know, right on the lake in the mid nineties, uh, the original pair showed up there and they picked the penthouse, a flower pot on the balcony of the penthouse to try to nest. Well, it just so happens the owner of the penthouse was the owner of the Cleveland Indians. And I guess if you have the penthouse with the lake view, you want to be able to use your balcony. Well, if peregrines nested in your flower pot, that wasn't going to happen. So they called Division of Wildlife and they, all they told them was remove the flower pot. Just take the flower pot, off, the flower pot out of there. They won't have anything in the nest. But the Division of Wildlife did come out and put a nest box on the top of Winton Place. Well, the peregrines didn't choose that. They ended up at Hilliard Road Bridge. So, which is far better a place to watch them. So we're very grateful to Dick Jacobs, the owner of the Indians at that time, <laughs> uh, because you, that wouldn't have been a good place at Witten. So that's when we started watching when they ended up there in the mid nineties at Hilliard. And um, once we started watching them, that, that was it. I mean, we, we used to go down the terminal tower. That was the first pair in Cleveland in the early nineties, watch a little bit down there from public square, but um, for those of you who know, at that time, Public Square was not a very nice place to be with uh, binoculars and cameras and stuff. So, uh, you know, so we didn't spend much time. So when we found out they were at Hilliard, that's when we really started watching. And then we uh, really became hooked. And, you know, we watched them for years, probably seven, eight years before we even uh, started taking pictures. We were not photographers, but we wanted to you know, we saw such cool stuff. We wanted to just try to show people the amazing things these birds can do. So uh, that's that's really how we get we got into taking pictures. So uh, yeah, and um, you know, before we got started with our program, and and uh, there were people filtering in. You were seeing some of the people that used to be watching the CMNH Falcon Cam Forum, which was the the Clean Museum of Natural History had a, a cam up on the Terminal Tower nest. And that was uh, that drew in a lot of people that were interested in the falcons and their activities and things. And like Chad said, we really liked watching that. But to see them live was just a totally different ball game. And to be able to to go down and watch them and just even seeing them fly into the bridge uh, up to land at, at the speeds that they go and the way that they're able to pull out of a, a speedy stoop is is amazing. So um, we have a slide up right now that shows the Hilliard Road Bridge from a distance from the south end. And uh, there's also a little bit of uh, machinery underneath right now. They're they're working on the they're actively working underneath the bridge, and the parking lot is closed right now. And and uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But the the future of the bridge is really uh, up in the air right now. Um, they're going to be reconstructing, uh, demolishing, and reconstructing the bridge in the next couple of years. Um, but for right now, we're really glad that this year ended up being so good for this pair. Um, they've had a little bit of a rough history lately. Um, the picture to the right is uh, a picture into the nest site. When we used to go up with Ohio Division of Wildlife, we used to watch. Uh, we used to go up on the catwalk underneath the bridge and walk out. We'd go into the into the catwalk and underneath, and we were able to see into the nest and get a glimpse at eggs and chicks and things. Um, but there's concrete buildup, and it's just a little natural bowl in there that you can see. It's actually the male that's in on the bowl on the eggs right now, and the females in the foreground. Um, kind of watching us watch her. She's not, <laughs> she's not liking us up there. That's for yeah. sure. So those were really, really fun times. Again, Division of Wildlife is another group that we really need to thank because they were always really helpful in letting us see these birds. Um, just, just in case anybody doesn't know, Ohio quit banding in 2014. They quit banding the peregrines. So they don't really, the Division of Wildlife doesn't really monitor much anymore. Uh, we give them some information of a few sites, but um, uh, so the banding stopped in Ohio, but a lot of the surrounding states continue to ban. We're going to try to go through this somewhat quickly because uh, we do have a lot of slides and we do end up talking loud, long. So we're going to try to see how much we can get through without going too into detail. Yeah. But um, this is the first pair, Buckeye and Hillary, that we that we watched at the Hillary Road Bridge. And, and Buckeye um, was the first actual peregrine that we got to see in the wild. Um, you want to say more about that? No, actually, uh, 
Yeah, once we, like I said, which, once we started watching, Buckeye is actually from Columbus. Um, he was banded. He was born in Columbus. Uh, the female Hillary was unbanded. She came in as, actually as a first year bird. He was Akron. Oh, it's Akron. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, he was Akron. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, we watched them all the way up till um, Buckeye uh, having an eye problem. And then he ended up being overtaken by the next male. Um, Hillary was an unbanded bird, as Chad said, and um, and this is another picture of Hillary and Buckeye. Um, we used to take pictures with a, a spotting scope. We did digiscoping for a while. We couldn't, of course, capture any flight photography, but the, the camera did pretty well. We had a little four <laughs> megapixel uh, camera that attached to a spotting scope, and it did pretty well for a while to get some pictures of, of Hillary and Buckeye back then. Um, and then Titan came in in 2007, and uh, we have a lot to a lot of connections with these different birds. But Titan's actually a bird that we named and banded uh, with the Division of Wildlife in Canton, yeah. and uh, and he ended up coming and overtaking um, Buckeye at the Hilliard site. Um, so then it was Hilliard, Hillary with Titan in 2007, and then in 2011 we witnessed a, a really amazing fight battle between two females from Pennsylvania. Now that we, we might have some Pennsylvania uh, falcon watchers in the audience, but Pennsylvania, we've been really uh, sharing peregrines with that with our neighboring state quite a bit. So we have a lot in common with uh, Pennsylvania as far as our connections and um, we have gotten to know some of those people and they're really great friends. Um, and, uh, and this was a battle between a bird from McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania. They don't name their birds in, in Pennsylvania. So we just called her McKees for short. And then, uh, and Gigi, uh, again, they don't name them. So we, uh, we call her Gigi because they used to call her green girl. She has green tape on her, on her leg, on her band. So, um, so we just call her Gigi. And uh, in 2012, they came in and they battled after Hillary was already killed by we think McKees yeah. and then um, uh, Gigi was able to escape this grip when uh, on the right upper corner um, McKees has the upper hand it looks like she has she has uh, Gigi pinned but Gigi was able to slip out of that the fight continued on the other side of the river and uh, she was able to get McKees out of there. Uh, I, I just want to say uh, th about this fight this was really cool because you know, we saw McKee sitting up on the bridge and we were actually getting ready to leave. We started walking out and then all of a sudden we heard the noise. We heard the screeching, we're, you know, and we're thinking, oh, something's going on up there. That's not the mayo. That's not the courtship or anything. And then we saw the wings flapping. So we backed up. We saw feathers flying. And all of a sudden at the upper picture there at the left, they came to the edge and then they tumbled right down to the river uh, like somersaulting engaged and so that's when we uh you know started taking the pictures went over there people were walking by on the path saying what is that noise i mean uh, it was amazing <laughs> the screeching the the biting the 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 talenting and then they would take breaks and then look at each other again and they'd start up again and it it seemed to us it like it went 10 minutes but we checked our our uh, the clock and everything and or the camera and it was only like three minutes but uh, it was an amazing thing to witness peregrines are very aggressive they're very territorial um they they they're they do fight a lot and this is just uh their nature this is what happens it was really intense we see a lot of intense things with peregrines and chad has to laugh at me because i was just repeatedly saying oh my god oh my god <laughs> because it was just as we're taking pictures we just couldn't believe what we were seeing and it just to to get to see this uh just national geographic moment play out in front of us was pretty amazing it was just really phenomenal um and it's just some shots with Gigi and titan again we'll try to breeze through these a little bit Gigi's beautiful and yeah. just amazing and I, I don't know if sue's out there but sue actually picks picked her up from pennsylvania yeah. um in pennsylvania uh when she first fled she ended up on the ground yeah she's from harrisburg she's from harrisburg pennsylvania and she will she will actually be 13 this year so Gigi is actually starting to get up there in age for a peregrine so you know i mean you just never know uh how long she's going to make it some shots of Gigi with telus including a, a bat capture um at one point um and some more of telus with Gigi. 
Peregrines love water. We had a lot of bathing shots, a few flight. Tell us in the fall. Um, this, uh, this branch that's pretty close to the bridge has become a real nice spot. Um, it's withering away and breaking off and, and continuing to lose branches. And um, we don't know how long that, that nub is going to last, but, um, and it's even broken off since this picture, but it's, uh, it's been a really nice spot for them to perch kind of close. And uh, this was telling. Yeah, from the top of the bridge, it's a great view. You're, you're looking right down on them, not very far away. We had an intruder named Pops who was from Chicago. He was banded black over blue and we were able to read his bands. And uh, he was interacting with Gusto in, in 2020, um, but Gusto won over the site. And then it ended up being Gusto and Gigi from 2020 to now. And, um, and they, like I said, had a really good year this year. So there's Gusto. And um, we, we love the individual variation in peregrines too. They're really distinguishable even when they're not banded. And Gusto, you can see has a, what we call a buffy brow. He has a real white above the forehead there, above, yeah. his, above his beak. And um, he's very white chested too. And you'll see that in comparison with Gigi, even though she's pretty white chested as a female too. There's Gigi. Um, so here's the start of the 2021 season at Hilliard. And um, uh, we're not able to show everything because it's back in the bridge and you can't get a view into the nest like we can at some of our other sites at Cleveland Clinic and Terminal Tower and some of the others, we can really see the nest. But back in here, we have to sort of guesstimate what's going on based on the behavior. And when they go up in and they're back in that bowl, we can't see them anymore because we can't get on the catwalk. So we can't see them and what they're doing. Um, up on the left is just a little bit of food play, uh, the male uh, Gusto on the right with Gigi coming for it, and uh, Gusto wasn't giving it to her that day, <laughs> so he, he didn't give her any food gift that day. But That's all part of, part of a courtship that starts in the wintertime. The male starts bringing food to the female, and peregrines have a very elaborate courtship. Uh, this is an example of uh, some challenging. There's challenging at all times of the year, and you just never know when somebody's going to be overtaken. And Gigi's getting up there a little bit, so she's uh, she's going to be a little vulnerable here as time goes on. But um, in the in the winter of 2021, this uh, uh, competing female up to the left, you can see that she's much more heavily flecked in the chest, and she was unbanded as well. But we knew it wasn't Gigi because we could tell from the markings and the behavior. And um, she kept coming in and out and Gigi at one point ended up pretty bloody. You can see her up by her head and, and face and then by her uh, leg. So she did get in, in, into a confrontation, but she ended up okay and uh, made it through. And then here's um, Gusto from the back. They just have a beautiful shape uh, and, and coloration. Um, yeah, just beautiful blue gray feathers, depending on what lighting they're in, it could look anywhere from a a light gray to a, a steel gray to a blue gray to even black. And some of their markings, um, that's just the different, when they brought the peregrine back, uh, uh, it's just a different subspecies they used. They used the three North American subspecies um, to captive breed. And then for a, a short time, they used a couple other, they used a uh, South America subspecies and a Mediterranean for a short time and then they went back to just the three subspecies. So that's the different markings that you see. You could also see uh, from this back shot that this is uh, the only bird prey with the wing coverts. Uh, the touching only the, falcon. The only yeah. falcon with the wing coverts uh, coming to the tail tip. Or, be or below, or, or below. sometimes they're below yeah. the, the primaries are below the tail tip. So if you get to see them perched, you can know a peregrine from that. Um, if it's if it's not a very good view of the bird, yeah. but you can see that. Um, so a mating season <laughs> in the in the winter to spring, they start mating. Um, and a little bit about peregrine development. This this is a picture from another site. This is from Bond uh, Apartment Building downtown Cleveland, another site that we can go and check and look in. And um, you can see the the chicks here are very young, uh, just pretty newly hatched, a couple days. And the other egg on the right was starting to crack open. Uh, they, they form a little, what they call a pip. And that pip turns into a larger hole and then cracks around. And the, 
and the chick uses its falcon tooth on the top of the beak, which you can see on the left picture, uh, left chick, um, or both chicks, and it, they chisel away around the eggshell. And um, and this this eggshell to the right ended up uh, covering over the other egg, but they all hatched, so they had mm -hmm. four that year. And it could take them anywhere from like 24 hours to 72 hours to go actually all around the egg and hatch. Yeah, so. Um, another picture from a different site, since we can't see up into this, Hilliard. This is Terminal Tower. This is Terminal Tower, uh, when the chicks were about four weeks old. And this is a fun stage because they're really, do, uh, they're starting to lose that, those downy feathers and they're starting to have the, the uh, feathers underneath grow in, just grow in and um, they, they transition, they start their transition to, uh, to partial dependence from the partial dependence from the parents. Um, they start doing flapping and taxiing and practicing their skills. Um, a lot hopping on the ledges. Yeah, it's just amazing. Uh, they go from hatch hatchlings in six weeks, they're flying. I mean, it's amazing how quickly they grow. And like their first, right about their first three weeks, all their energy goes into bone development. And then from then on, the last three weeks, it's like feather development. So that's when you really see the feathers coming out. And this is about the age where you can really, really get to distinguish size and, and gender. Um, yeah. So you can see that the females are bigger, uh, larger head size and bill and, and feet. Um, and they also are slower to develop. So the males start catching up even if they're later born or later hatched. And then they start to catch up and overtake. Sometimes we get a premature departure from the nest. We won't go into this too much, but we've had to pick up some that have just ended up out of the nest just too early. This is one of the ones. This one's from an I-90 bridge site before the I-90 bridge was demolished um, a while back. So, And this is back at the Hilliard site. So everything from here is, is pretty much Hilliard. Yeah. But um, once they're on the ledges, they start walking around the ledges on the inside and the outside. And you can see this is the three from this year. They're starting to lose their uh, down. And uh, as they flap, they flap it away. And yeah, they taxi, they run up and down the arches. They're, they're, they're very vocal. Um, it gets very noisy sometimes on the, under the bridge when they scream for food. Uh, they're very social. Um, they, there's a lot of interaction between the juvies. It can be hard to distinguish size from a distance, so we just do our best to see when they're together to compare size differences. This year, we were able to tell that there were two males and a female, which helped us to have a little bit more of an estimate of um, fledge time. Uh, the males typically uh, fledge first uh, before the females. They, they have a, um, a quicker de de yeah, development. They, they develop faster. Mm -hmm. Three to four is average, but we've had some nests with five. Uh, rare is six and seven. We've never had a six or seven young nest. Now, um, at all of our sites, we try to be very careful not to pick up a bird unless it's absolutely necessary. And it sort of depends on the um, on the the site and the dangers and the vulnerabilities that they have. And at this site, we can pretty much keep an eye on them and watch them until or unless they get into a spot where we don't think they're going to get out of it. Um, and in that case, there are foxes there and coyotes and all kinds of things. So we'll pick them up if they seem to be in trouble. And Nomad, we watched him a while, but he ended up sort of in a in a bad spot. We, we called this guy Nomad. Yeah, he actually, <laughs> actually his second flight, he ended up in the woods. So yeah. we we had to go in and find him, and we wanted to get him out of there. Uh, you know what? First thing peregrines do when they end up on the ground, their instinct they immediately look around how to ladder up, how to get higher. So he hopped up on a fallen tree and he was immediately looking. He climbed up as far as he could, uh, but we wanted, it was easy for us to get him. We have a great release spot to get him back up on this bridge. Um, We're gonna get that. I know, so I, but <laughs> um, like I say, we, we just wanted to get him out of there with the coyotes and the foxes around, so. Yeah, here he was ambling around in the support of the bridge, and he even ended up taking a little bath. He ended up right by the river, and he, he while he was there, he took a little bath, and then he got back up. Um, he ended up walking up this uh, fallen log or tree here that was wedged up against the bridge, right by the warning sign, and um, walked up the bridge, uh, up the uh, tr tree to the highest point. Like Chad says, they'll try to get to the highest point yeah. they can get to to get a good takeoff point. And uh, at the bottom left picture shows he was just there with his wings out for a long time, just looking for his next place to go to. 
he took a flight but um and sustained his height but didn't have another mm -hmm. landing spot so he ended up um down and in the woods so like yeah. chad said so we, got we picked him up and this is a this is the site where we can release them back we way back in the day we would actually take them up to the top of the bridge and, and give them another shot and just throw them off um well, not throw them, well, just not throw them off but let yeah. release them at the top of the bridge and that didn't always work out great they didn't always uh you know it's not the best of situations um uh kind of like the only thought the only thing that we thought we could do but then we figured out that we could walk underneath we can hike down underneath the i-90 bridge and um put the carrier on the ledge of the i-90 bridge and let them walk right out onto the ledge, which is parallel to the Hilliard Road Bridge. And so, you know, you can see kids go up there and they, you know, have their fun up, up in the underneath the I-90. Do bridge. their graffiti, as you yeah. can see. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, when we go uh, underneath there to release a bird, we just stay there with them and make sure that they walk their way out. And um, this worked perfectly. He got, uh, he walked out of the carrier, it took him a little while to get out of the carrier, but once he did, he walked right out of the carrier onto the ledge and the picture on the left shows he could walk all the way along that ledge down to the support. Um, and that's what he did. Yeah. Um, yeah, every time we've tried this over the years, it, it's worked perfectly. They walk down, they hop on the support, they're right across from the nest site. The parents immediately come over, usually with food. So it, it, that, that's far better than what we used to do. This is Nomad again, just even after he was uh, back safely um, on the bridge and, and fed and everything else, he's still a little bit klutzy. So they're, uh, after their first pledges, they still pick poor landing spots or miss yeah, landings. Miss or, land, yeah. They're still learning a lot. They, they know how to fly. Um, it's not that they're learning how to fly. It's learning the other skills of landing and picking the right spots to land and things yeah. like that. Um, Nitro was the second to fledge. We, we just named them. Uh, they, we were lucky this year in that they had different Malar markings. They markings. had different facial you markings. You could tell them apart good this year. Yeah. yeah. And Nitro ended up on uh, the highway <laughs> for a little while. Um, he ended up, this rightmost picture, he ended up gripping on uh, right below right below him was the highway so that was one of the places he ended up and then um that's nomad actually on the bottom right yeah. he was up there with him on this day when Gigi was watching carefully and feeding them <laughs> and this is a, the food there is uh, up by the sidewalk on the top of the bridge that's the adult brought some food to that one and their, their um, aggression and independence develops almost instantaneously. You can see this one's coming at the adult. This is Nitro coming at the adult Gigi uh, to try to get food from her, try to food beg. She didn't have any food at the time. And here he is on the right uh, looking at an ant in just really a lot of curiosity. It, it's almost, you know, once the young fledge and they're flying around, it's almost constant screaming for food they're they're always wanting food especially that female there she was screaming all the time for food even when they're full and they have a big crop they're screaming for food another nitro picture with a, a grip on the tree we're going to show some of the some of the things that uh, they do are just really comical they can get yeah. very cat-like with their energy and start to bounce around and yeah. jump around and stab at things and all kinds of fun stuff um Nomad with nitro. Nomad, you could see, has a really dark had a really dark head. Um, Mallars, he, he had a, more of a hood look. Yeah. And nitro, you could see, was really light in comparison. Yep. Light head, um, light crown. Um, they were pretty easy to distinguish. Yep. And that's just the different subspecies they use. And then noble, the female, the lone female. <laughs> <laughs> the first day that she fle uh, fledged, she ended up in the close tree and she stayed there and stayed there and stayed there and just begged for food so so much it was uh just she couldn't she couldn't do enough begging and that puffed out posture um i posted on we posted on our our page a, a little video clip of her food begging just screaming away but she puffs out her posture and she or her feathers and and puts out her wings and just uh screams <laughs> yeah when, when they see the adults it's food food all right, a few more after she started to mature a little bit more and lost some of that down, some of the remaining down. And this is 
uh, Noble again. And Noble, like I said, saving that tree a lot. So um, at this point, uh, the adults were trying to get her to leave the tree and flew by her a couple of times with food. They, they'll do a little bit of luring behavior. So they'll try to get them out of situations sometimes. Yeah, especially or, if they're in a dangerous situation. Yeah. And, uh, and here it was uh, Noble with uh, Gigi trying to come over to give her food. She flew over, flew around her, finally landed. And this picture to the right, she has, she's got to hold on to mom for balance a little bit as she's grabbing the food from her. Um, so she, she did give her food in the tree eventually. She relented. <laughs> and, and this is uh, Noble with Nomad. Um, Nomad hanging upside down. <laughs> he came in for a landing and uh, didn't quite stick the landing. <laughs> few more of noble yeah. and nomad as we had, as we had said they're very social um sometimes you, you'll see they rub beaks they bite each other's feathers they talon each other um just there's at this stage they're so fun to watch and you'll see on the rightmost picture you'll see uh no nomad to the left and noble to the right uh, you can see the size difference and you can see the head size difference and the shape of the head is different um females are more angular headed uh bulkier Mostly, body yeah. Yeah, and the males are a little rounded headed, headed. Um, but like I said, Nomad really helped us out by having that real dark pattern to his head. But um, the the word uh, Tiercel is what they call the male, and that's um, because the males are one third. It's usually around one third, but you can it varies though. You can get a you can get a big female with a small male, and it's really pronounced. Or we've had some sites where you have a big male with a smaller female, and it, it's a lot harder to tell. So. There is some differences. A few more of the, the uh, little bit of clumsiness. What's the saying? There? Yeah, and, and, then, and then they start attacking. They start talent in the branch and biting pieces of the bark and really active. Very fun to watch at this stage, even though any small mistake could lead to injury, but they're yeah. just really fun to watch. And here's the trio honing in on something down at the water, at the river there. And I wonder if everybody can tell who's who. Yeah. <laughs> so remember, Nomad's the dark-headed one. He's to the left. Um, Nitro's to the right with the light head. And then and the in the middle female. is the bigger female, no Noble. And here's a light shot of the three of them together coming out of the tree. Did a lot of hanging out together. We wanted to speak a little bit about ter territoriality and how they teach the young. Uh, the same tactic. Yeah, peregrines are, are very territorial, um, especially they ramp it up during uh, the courtship and then when the eggs are laid and once the eggs hatch and when the young are ready to fly and have fledged, they are very uh, territorial. They will drive out any other raptor that comes close. Um, unfortunately, sometimes they they even will knock other raptors out of the sky. We've seen that many times where in this Hilliard Road Bridge, there's a lot of red tails right around the general area. Um, I think over the years, the red tails have known to pretty much stay away from that bridge, but sometimes the younger red tails have come in and we've seen them just knock them right out of the sky and uh, they are really defensive parents when they have young. And the leftmost picture is uh, Gigi going after a heron, a great blue heron, but uh, she realized kind of quickly that the heron had a broken leg. And their leg was sort of swaying and she left them alone. She let them get out of there. She just wanted them out. She did not do anything. Yeah. And then um, to the right is a, a competing a first year bird that came in at that time in the off season. So and then the bottom right is um, one of the young from this year. I think it was Nitro chasing after a turkey vulture yeah. kind of taking after his parents. <laughs> And this is a aerial food drop. This is a, a really cool time to watch. Uh, once the young are flying for a week or so and their uh, parents think they're able that they come in with food dangling and the juvie, the youngsters chase them and they, they invert and go, go up and grab it either from the feet or the beak. Sometimes they do a, a drop. This was a drop. 
Here you see the two juvies chasing one of the adults. Um, this is this is a really fun time to, to watch all these food exchanges. Yeah, here Gusto was, uh, he caught the bird, we think right underneath the bridge because yeah. we were on top at the time. Yeah. And he brought it out and the ju juveniles just start chasing after him and they start pursuing him. And as they were catching up, he let it go. And it's just a barely, you know, a little bit wounded dove that this started to fall. And the, it took the juveniles by the by surprise. It was a little bit early for them, it mm. seemed. They weren't quite that advanced. Um, we didn't quite catch the action, but uh, Gusto started up the highest after he released the bird. The juveniles missed the flying, the still alive uh, dove, and he dove down right above the river and snagged the dove again and brought it back to give it to him on the edge. Yeah, yeah. So it just showed that speed and agility and that, that reaction. It just, it's phenomenal to see. This is another really fun time to watch. Once the juvies start playing and become adept, a little more adept at flying, they start doing aerial play. It's called mock combat. You'll see in the picture there, they start grabbing each other. And that's all a learning process for when they disperse the nest. They don't have mom and dad to protect them. So they're gonna to have to defend themselves. So they do a lot of interaction in the air. It's, it's really fun to watch. They dive on each other. Um, that, that's a really fun time. There's the big three to the left here. So yeah, do a lot of tail grabbing. They do a lot of mac, mock uh, aerial yep. exchanges. Yeah, it's really fun. And they love water like Chad was. And it's, <laughs> that, this is one reason why we love the Hillier site, uh, you know, so much because it's it's their closest we have to a natural site. Watching them in a natural cliff site is amazing, but unfortunately we don't have that. But at least Hilliard has trees. They have the water, so you know they're not on a building all the time or a bridge. So we see them in the water. Peregrines love water. They love nesting by water, not only for prey, but they love to bathe. They love to go down and drink water. They were going almost every day uh, down to the water, and they're they're really tolerant. Once they know that you're not going to get any closer, you're able to get pretty close to them. They're not skittish like some of the other raptors. Um, they sort of know that, you know, that, yeah, of course, they probably recognize us, you know, since we're there so much, but uh, they look at you. And then if you just stop and just stay still, you could get fairly close to them a lot of times in the water, especially the youngsters. Yeah. Just so, gotta make sure they know you're not a, you're not a threat. Yeah. And, and that it, yep. they, they adapt very quickly. Oh, some more water. Some action. more bathing and playing in the water. And yeah, this this trio went down pretty often. Yeah. Um, Nomad not as much as the other two, but we we got to see the other two in the water. I would say what? Oh, it was a lot. Yeah. I don't know, seven or eight times yeah. at least. They were they were at the. And river. I'm sure we missed a lot too. So. Yeah, bathing and drinking. Loving that water. Um, oh, I would say one thing too, though. Um, sometimes the adults would be on the sides watching them bathe or drink or things like that. And um, and if if we were getting into position and we were uh, and they weren't noticing us, she would keck real low, real low kecking call, like you know, just to just to alert them that we were there. And as long as we stayed back she was fine yeah. but um as soon as you start walking yeah, a little closer those adults would, would start kick, 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 kick. so we could pay attention to those cues too and and the the young did too you could see them pay attention and and lift up if she was getting nervous so um they do a lot of uh mock prey play before they're really able to capture prey themselves and they're really before those skills develop they do a lot of breaking off twigs and and grabbing leaves off the treetops. Yeah, fly over the trees and break stuff, grab the twigs or leaves. Here he's just biting off a little twig. It's all just practice of those skills that are so necessary for their for their for their abilities or for their life. <laughs> and they chase each other. So you they can, act you like can see the ones carrying a good size uh, twig there, good mm -hmm. size branch. Um, this was after uh, a food exchange, a uh, tug of war with food after it was partly consumed. Um, but this is an example of a, a regular uh, beak to or foot to foot aerial food exchange. So sometimes it is put in the beak of the adult and handed off to the inverted 
feet of the juvenile and sometimes he keeps it in his foot and it depends on, or his feet and it depends on the size of the prey yeah. and how fast the juveniles approaching and the direction yeah generally if he comes up with a bigger bird it's feet uh smaller they dangle it from the from the beak beak so it, it just depends yeah so here gusto brought one for uh um, no no nitro 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 yeah for nitro and he grabbed it and then later the two brothers were tugging at it uh when when it was partially eaten eaten so they wrestle over it but they usually let it yeah let it go for the other um we wanted to share a little bit about kingfishers here yeah there's a right there on this under the bridge well a little little bit down on the bank we have nesting kingfishers and it's they're very interesting to watch but with the young you, you could see the young chasing the young kingfishers or the adult kingfishers and um so it's it really interesting the interaction between the predator and prey uh having the kingfishers there right right where the peregrines are and we'll we'll show a little we were able to witness actually um we were, this is the start of it. yeah we were able to witness this was really fascinating um one of the young kingfishers was flying up and down the river and all three youngsters started chasing it and they would repeatedly uh, you know go to grab it and the kingfisher would dive in the water to escape but what happened they kept doing it kept doing it and finally the two males gave up they just went on the bank and watched but the female kept it up and we think that it just wore that young kingfisher out because she all of a sudden she got up out of the water and flew towards the woods and we thought oh she's going to go in the woods she's going to make it but she ended up on the bank and as you see in the picture the young female just turned and went right to the bank and got her yeah we, and we won't show the eating we, we recognize we're talking to an audubon group among yes. other bird lovers um and we do we love uh kingfishers too uh, you know we it's not that we like to see these birds torn up or anything like that um we really it was it was actually bittersweet because we watched this family of yeah. kingfishers survive flooding the flooding river and um be able to successfully raise uh three young three um young. Out, yeah. that made it out of the burrow and and i think the female uh, died at some point we didn't start we started not seeing the adult female um and then we saw this and it was you know nature in action yeah, which was... we love to see but we we also hate to see yeah that that yeah. you know after watching them so long so um but really it's nature in action and yeah, it's just, you know yep different experience when it comes to peregrines i think because it's just a part of the cycle uh picture of nomad yeah back shot. Back shot. you can see the youngsters are more brownish they don't have the yellow uh eye uh eye rings the sear the yellow feet yet or of course some of the youngsters get a little bit yellow feet earlier uh, but then the adults are when they start molting they're turned to to the blue gray and get all the yellow and get more barring than the streaking yeah you can see the buffy tail tip and yeah the, yeah the scalloped uh, feathers there really beautiful in different light and they can vary a lot too coloration mm -hmm. wise yeah. some more pictures of the pair of the two they also get harassed a lot by other yeah. birds <laughs> yeah, yeah. sometimes over the years we've been able to find them because of blue jays and robins and orioles yeah they just they just scream if we if we can't find them and they might be in the woods somewhere perched all you got to do is follow the blue jays or like or the orioles or robins they just you know a lot of times they lead us right to them they will actually harass them they try to hit them blue jays especially they will hit them even the orioles you know they know perch like that they're not a threat yeah yeah and the, this uh picture to the right shows the curiosity that of of a peregrine they can turn their heads pretty far <laughs> to try to get a different angle at something and that's that's their their curiosity you can just almost see the wheels turning as they're starting to pick up on their environment um this is another aerial food exchange but a really lengthy one and, and really fascinating to us because it was later in the season when um when noble was kind of not doing as much of her own hunting and we think that there was a purpose that this was longer than normal food exchange did you want to say something no. okay so gusto came in with the bird 
dangling it and uh, kind of almost teasing her with it. Um, turned to the side and it looked like there could have been a food exchange at this left picture. It looked like it would have been a pretty simple grab, but instead he kind of kept going and wheeled around and she dropped back. Um, and eventually he turned to the back and dropped the bird. And uh, as, as Noble prepared to catch it, it went by her. She got a talon on yeah, it. She almost got <laughs> it with one talon here and just missed it. So then she had to right herself and start her dive down um, while Gusto was watching from above. And she uh, she dove down and was able to recapture the, the falling prey. Yeah. So that's a pretty cool food exchange to see. And as you can see, the picture on the left, yes. <laughs> she was awfully full. She didn't really need food necessarily. Yeah, she, she already had a full crap there, but yeah, she'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> They could afford to play with their food when they're not too hungry. <laughs> a few flight shots. Some flight shots. We wanted to show some uh, pictures of uh, subadults, uh, pictures of birds that are in between that that plumage. So um, the picture on the very right, you can see the back plumage. It's mostly brown, but there are a few gray spare feathers yeah. mixed in. Um, the front of the bird in, in their first year it is start as it's starting to change it's it's looking like it's changing from streaking to barring yep and their first mold is not a complete mold so you, they generally have a few brownish feathers on them um this is actually pops to the left that we showed as an adult previously but we he came into the site when he was a first year bird as well so we were able to identify him as a first year bird and then he came back as an adult which is one thing that's still really cool about the banding because then we get to know a lot about a bird that we get to see frequently. Yeah, if you could read the bands on the bird, say a, band, a banded bird comes in, you'll know everything about that bird, where it's from, when it was banded, if that state named them, um, age, everything. Yeah, we're getting to the point where we have less and less banded birds because we don't have banding in Ohio anymore. So yeah. we're seeing more unbanded. And, um, you know, we've gotten pretty good because we know them at being able to tell the difference between unbanded birds just by their behavior, but, and, and their look, but, um, it, it helps to have the bands that way. And, um, we're going to try to work with, uh, the, the bridge crew. This bridge is slated to yeah. be, uh, they're going to start demolishing the bridge in May of 23. So we're going to at least get next year nesting season. And we'll probably get the year after because they're not going to be able to start in May. Um, it's still a federal law. You can't disturb a nesting bird of prey. So by May, they're going to have youngsters up there. So we're going to talk to the bridge people over the years. We've, they've been very good. Um, also, big projects, projects like that, a lot of times they get pushed back. So we're hoping they push it back. But I'm sure once they know there's there's that there are young peregrines up there, they will probably push it back. They've done it over the years at different locations for us. So, um, yeah. you know, so we're hoping to get two, two more nesting seasons, uh, successful nesting seasons. Uh, they said it's gonna take three years for a total new bridge. So who knows, we, we've thought about maybe trying to put a nesting tray up under the I-90 you'll see there in the picture that runs parallel, but, there's going to be so much commotion there with getting all that concrete out. We don't know if they go over there. They might just leave and try to find another spot um, yeah. somewhere else. But so hopefully we'll get the two, at least two more years anyway. We'll see. We're hopeful that we love the site, obviously, but we've had really good success in working with other um, bridge crews and other building crews before, um, you know, with Div Division Wildlife, they've been yeah. really had great relationships they've really nurtured those relationships over the years with different people yeah. to get the work done safely for the parents as much as possible um just some pictures of the adults um this is gusto augusto right yep augusto yeah. and um gg on the left um gusto has never gone to the light poles that we've seen yet so if a bird's on the light pole it's either probably Gigi or um, an intruder. Yeah, all the other males historically that have been there, they come right up to the to the lights or the light pole, which is only really about 15 feet above you when you're walking on a sidewalk and they're, they're laying right up there. But for some reason, Gusto, you know, he's been there like a year and a half now. He's never been up there. He just won't come up. He's fine in the tree. He's fine with you looking at him and photographing, but he just, 
he just will not come up on top of that bridge uh, to the poles. So um, we thought we'd take just a minute. I know we're running a little yeah, we'd close like on to have, time. Save time for questions, and we want to save time for questions. But we just like to go over uh, one one really cool experience that's not about the Hilliard Road Bridge. Do we have time for that, Nancy? We okay on that? Hopefully. Um, so we'll we'll just go through. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, this yeah, was, yeah, please. Okay. Please okay. This was really cool because it involved, uh, you know, a lot of people, but this is the Cleveland Zoo. Uh, they had all these decorations. It was the Asian Lantern Festival, all these different, um, you know, decorations. And this young female had just fledged and she actually ended up, ended up on this lily pad on uh, down from the bridge. And so all these people were coming by and it was amazing. She was there all day and everybody's stopping and just the people's reaction over there. We have some other, I think we have some yeah, other, oh yeah, we have yeah, <laughs> other pictures. But anyway, a lot of people, the families would go by and the kids would say, mom, look at that bird. That bird's up there on that lily pad. And the, a lot of times the adults, <laughs> the adults would say, ah, that's just fake. That's nothing. And then they see it move and oh my gosh, that's not, <laughs> what is that? And I mean, everybody is close here and she was just fine until these, uh, we had a pair of nesting blue gray gnat catchers that nested in not far in the tree along the, the creek there. And they were just pounding it. <laughs> they were coming out and pounding her on and hitting her head. Here he's actually taking pieces of down that yeah. she hasn't shed yet off her head, probably to use in the nest for them. But uh, yeah, she was just getting harassed and people were loving that. They were this, just. Yeah, this was literally all day. This was uh, we we went in right after the zoo opened and found her. Uh, you know, we got a little tip from somebody in the zoo. It was funny. We were but, down by the yeah. bridge trying to find her. We said, wow, she must be she must have fledged. We got to look around. And then one one of the youngsters was up on the, up on the top of the bridge. And we were I was looking with binoculars and this young girl comes by and she goes, are, are you looking at that bird up there? I says, yeah, that's one of the young pairs. And she goes, I think there's one down there on the display right down there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we walked down and there she was. So luckily she gave us that tip, but this was just so much fun with every, all the zoo members coming in and everybody, I don't know how many cell phone pictures were taken uh, of her getting, <laughs> getting harassed. And she was really on this lily pad all day. She, she yeah, ended up laying was... down for a while. Um, you know, after they would, the Did you have blueberry... lay down pictures. No, I okay. didn't bring, yeah, I didn't put them in, but yeah, they, um, they, they she laid down for a little while when the blue gray net catchers left her alone for a spell. And, and we went for a little walk and came back and she's still there. And, um, finally got up like probably with 15 minutes before the zoo was going to close. She finally, finally started getting and, interested enough yeah. to go and the, the net catchers were away from her. Yeah. And she made it to a small tree. So and she yeah. acted, ended up fine. But um, so when they fledge, you just never know where they're going to end up. It's amazing. And um, as much as we love peregrines, we have to travel about 20 miles, I don't know, about 25, 25 miles. miles or so to see them a lot of the time into Cuyahoga County, which is why uh, we're in Cuyahoga County more than we're, we're in Lorraine, but we were treated to one in Lorraine last winter. And um, this one we ended up calling Lorraine because she was just so present and uh, cool to watch. We've had over the years, uh, pairs hang coming in Lorraine or single ones. We used to have, an, we used to, we got a nest box put up at an old power plant that has since been torn down, but they never used it. But we get individual parents coming in, spending the winter in Lorraine. We're hoping this year we get one. We've seen them, but we don't see anybody yet staying. But she, uh, she, this one here stayed all last winter, and we were able to really witness some really cool events here. And with the harbor frozen over, uh, the eagles were out trying to grab some birds off the ice and off the water uh, by the ice. And um, she was acting territorial and, and driving them out and things. Yeah. Even though funny. eagles are that much, so much bigger, they, they don't, peregrines are fearless. And this, this was an amazing, amazing sequence. We, we were, we were so lucky to capture here. Yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't put in the whole sequence and I know this is a little bit graphic again for bird lovers, but, uh, this ruddy duck was sitting in the Harbor and she was way on the coast guard tower, which is a pretty good distance yeah. away. And we watched her in the early morning light come off of that tower and that, you know, they're just so fascinating to see Hunt because you can see almost the strategy in action. It's yeah, she actually dove off this tower, which is up pretty high. And she, here she comes right down the channel of the river. And 
she actually goes over, there's a pier. She went over the pier and she came back low over the pier and then dove right down. And we think she hit this ready first because it's submerged and she wheeled around and as a ready stuck its head up out of the water, she she was right there and she snagged it right by the the, the bill there by the beak and just Okay, I pulled. think we're probably pushing our time. So we really appreciate it. And we want to probably leave room for be, uh, questions, just some additional behaviors that they're, they do. Mm -hmm. um, the right corner is a cast. They do, they, they cast out pellets, yes. just much yeah. like owls. Yeah. Um, you can see the seeds from the birds. The only thing difference is with peregrines, they digest a lot of the bones. Owls, you could take all the bones and see what they ate, but peregrines actually digest a lot of the bones. So mostly, as you could see, it's seeds or feathers or um and then i think we should do questions yeah because i know i have more yeah. slides but we're just yeah, uh let's get to some questions and then we'll just show the difference between peregrines and other birds and um we're ready for questions so we, we <laughs> tried to go through that quickly <laughs> all righty well wow 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 that's fantastic um yeah we have about 15 minutes before zoom is gonna toss us off Okay. Um, I know there are, let's see, um, do peregrine falcons migrate? Yes, they, they, they migrate, but the, the ones around our area don't, most of them don't. We've had a few over the years that did. Uh, we had one, uh, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It was born at actually, he was born at Hilliard. He was the last male of Buckeye. He would, three or four years in, he started to do a little partial migration. He, he wouldn't go until like uh, after Thanksgiving and he'd come back in February. But, um, but all our pairs stay around the winter. The cold doesn't bother them uh, and they have plenty of prey. So, but the Northern peregrines way up into Canada and in the Arctic, they're the real migrators. Yeah, and I think we're finding too that they're migrating less because they they want to hang on to their sites and they're there because there are more there's more competition. Yeah, there's now. definitely more more competition. There's probably there's more now uh, more peregrines in the in the east and Midwest than before before they were uh, totally wiped out. Yeah, good question. Have you ever tried doing a drone or has a drone been used to look at the nest on the Hilliard Road Bridge uh, uh, we, when the birds aren't close. there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have not. We have not. Um, actually, we ha we've had some people uh, stop with their drones and we sort of tell them, say, you know, that there's peregrines here and they have been known to knock those drones out uh, of the sky. Uh, I don't know what you, you know, one kid, I said, I, it looked like a really expensive drone. And I says, Hi, is that an expensive drone? And he goes, yeah, it is. And I told him, he goes, well, I'm, he, he headed out. He, he didn't fly it there. He didn't want to take a chance, but they have been known to, uh, to hit them um, because they think they're a threat. And as much as we want to see these birds, we really don't want to disturb them. Yeah. I mean, we're really opposed to using drones for peregrines because we know that they don't, they wouldn't appreciate that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we don't want anything that's going to change their, their behavior or have in, in their natural habitat. Yeah. Um, in fact, we, we try to be really sensitive to that even they don't like anything above them normally. So we try to be really sensitive to that um, and try to get to know the birds uh, where they're perched and, and how, how they're going to react to us. And we try to pay attention to that. Yeah. So we would never use a drone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Nancy, Nancy, you, you had mentioned you, you, you'd like this, uh, to talk a little bit how we got interested and, in, you know, and really once we, like I said before, once we started watching them, it's not only the flight, they're amazing flyers, the speed, the hunting, but the, it's the, that personality. Peregrines have such personality. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's amazing. They're, they're, they're so tolerant. They're, they're, we love their, their feisty aggressiveness. Um, yeah, it, but the gentleness too. Oh, so absolutely. You, you, could, you could go from seeing them almost tear apart a turkey vulture in the air to get it out of their territory to coming back in and feeding their young so tenderly with that big old beak compared to that little tiny chick beak that it, it just, it, they're just softly turning their head and, and just so nurturing to those young. It's, it's such a dichotomy that's just beautiful to Absolutely. witness. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, any young animal to me, I think, you know, has that playfulness, you know, like you're talking about the, the three, 
play fighting and writing off sticks and yes they're they're preparing for their for their grown up days but you know it's just like any young animal they're 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 yeah. curious they're playing yeah. I, I love yeah. that one looking at the ants he's like oh <laughs> yeah. yeah that's an ant cool. yeah. i think it's so fun yeah. yeah yeah well we thank you so 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 very much um i don't know if you can get me back to being a host if you hover over i think i can me um stop your screen sharing yep there you go because i want to thank everybody I really do want to thank everyone for being here this this uh, evening and we really thank you for that presentation just fabulous uh, lots of folks already been putting in the chat great presentation, thank you so much and continue the good work. Um, and um, hopefully with the new bridge that they put up eventually. Uh, will it be as pretty as the old hill you yeah, actually with the. Yeah, actually, they've had some meetings. Yeah. They want to make it look historic. They want to make it look really good. Um, so we're actually going to talk to them about a, a nesting tray up for them or a, bo a nesting box, uh, you know. Uh, so hopefully they will uh, agree to that, even though, it, you know, once they start, it's going to be three years. So yeah, and yeah. look for yeah. information on the bridge because they were taking suggestions about different ideas that uh, might they want to might might want to incorporate in, in with the bridge. Um, the one thing we're concerned about is that it has been a bridge that, that where there's been some suicides and we're yeah. not sure how that's going to impact the structure of it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there might be a, a fence up there. So, yeah, right. Yep. All righty. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Um, I, I, I just can't rave more and have a great holiday season, everybody. Um, be careful out there and, um, you know, check out our website, join the Christmas bird count. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm.